Christian, I feel the bottom. We can make it. I can see the gate. My burden. I can feel it. My sins are sinking me to the bottom. I can't escape. No, Christian. Your burden is gone. Open your eyes. You're going to make it to the other side. No, it's too deep. I've been abandoned. My sin was too great. You have been made whole. Look there. He waits for you. He made a promise to you, Christian. Yes. Yes, I see him again. I see the other side. I see it. I... Well, why don't I tell you how my journey began? As I said before, my name is Christian. That's me, sitting under that tree there. I should be easy to spot because of that enormous burden on my back. That burden, you see, was my sin. It was full of the lies that I had told, the things that I had stolen, the curses that I would said. Not everyone had such a burden where I lived. They all had sin, but they didn't feel troubled by it like I did, so it wasn't a burden to them. You see, I had been given a book the Holy Bible, and as I read it I became more and more aware that the city I lived in was going to be destroyed by fire. That is where I lived, the city of destruction. Sure, it seems obvious now that this place was destined for death, but sin had blinded me. I realized that because of sin, the city and its people would soon perish. I knew I had to escape somehow. I'd tried desperately to convince my wife of the destruction that was coming, but she enjoyed the world too much and didn't want to face the possibility of losing it. She called me a fool and thought of it no more. And so, I spent my days in the field, reading from my book, crying, not knowing what to do. It was that day that I met Evangelist. <sighs> what must I do to be saved? Um, excuse me, but what troubles you so much, young man? Well, you see, I've been reading this good book, and I know that I'm doomed to die for the sins that I carry. And I'm afraid that when I die, my burden will be so heavy that it will sink me lower than the grave. And so you would like to escape from this city, and also free yourself from that burden? Yes, but I can't see how that's possible. I am a wretched person. How can sin be undone? What hope is there for me? Well, do you see that light shining over the field? Go towards that light, and you will see a small gate. When you get there, knock, and you will be told what to do. Now, run, and don't look back. Well, look at that, Pliable. He's actually leaving this time. We should run after him, Obstinate, and bring him back with us. Just don't let him trick you with anything he says. I know how impressionable you are. Remember, he's not well in the head. Neighbors, why are you here? We've come to take you back with us, of course. That's not possible. Your city is going to be destroyed by fire. Come with me, good neighbors. And leave our friends and comforts behind. 
What could you possibly be searching for that would be worth leaving the whole world behind you? All of this is worthless compared with just a small piece of what I hope to enjoy. I seek an inheritance in heaven away from this world. Read about it here in this book. Ha! Away with your book! Are you coming back with us or not? I cannot. Let's go, pliable! Well, wait a second, obstinate. What if what he says is true? Maybe we should go with him. What's this? More fools still? There's no telling where this brain-sick man will lead you. Very well, go on with him. You'll be back. Well, we should get going. You say that you know the way to this magnificent place? I've been told by a man named Evangelist to go to a gate, and we will be given instructions there. So tell me more about this place where we are going. Well, it is a place of eternal life. There is no suffering, no cruelty, none of the horrible things of this world. We will meet God and live in a place that He has prepared for us. Why would God want us to live with Him? Are you sure we will be welcome? We are His creation, His children. He wants nothing more than for us to seek Him. Won't He know about the bad things I've done? I've done evil things as well, but God must have a way to cleanse me, or there wouldn't be such a desire in my heart to find Him. I can only trust that He will have a way to save me out of mercy. And you're sure that your book speaks the truth? It is written by God, and God cannot lie. I hope we will be there soon. Whoa! Oh, 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 oh. Is this your promised land? If this is what happens at the very start of our journey, who knows what dangers we will face later. I'm going home. They call this place the Swamp of Despond. People get stuck here all the time. My name is Help. You see, when you realized that you were a sinner, this place filled up like a swimming pool with your guilt and your fears and your doubts. The Lord has tried to fix this ground and even put good steps through it. But people still fall in all the time and get stuck in the waste of their own sin. I'm glad I was able to help you. You'd better be on your way now. You're right. Thank you. I can get back on my path now. I should be at the gate soon. Faith, 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 just a little bit of faith. Faith, 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 just a little bit of faith. What you got? Faith, 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 just a little bit of faith. Hope, 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 just a little bit of hope. Hope, 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 just a little bit of hope. You don't need a whole lot, just use what you got. Hope, 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 just a little bit of hope. Love, 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 just a little bit of love. Love, 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 just a little bit of love. You don't need a whole lot, just use what you've got. Love, 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 just a little bit of love. And now, back to Lamplighter Theatre. Enjoying the city, <laughs> although the smoke has taken some getting used to. Uncle is treating me well, but I find his home, well, albeit quite lovely, a bit dreary. It's so quiet here. I guess I'm used to more voices and laughter. 
And he's taken me to a few restaurants which have been quite fine, but it's not like mother's cooking. I seem to be doing well at work at the print shop. At least uncle seems to be pleased thus far. It's hard work. The shop gets very hot and it can get awful lonely. I've been working long days and Um, may I help you? Yes, sir. I'm here to get some posters for my father, Gershwin Adamson. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, yeah. There you go. Watch it, boy. The ink from your hands is smudging on the papers there. Uh, oh, um, my apologies. Let me, uh, let me wipe that off. No, 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 please. Don't touch anything. You're, you're covered with ink. <laughs> well, I do work in a print shop. Where's a fresh rag? It is by the window. It's just next to the bucket of water. I see. Good. Yes. All right. Well. Oh. I don't know how you work in a place like this. Look at you. Ink under your fingernails and ink in your hair. And I, the smell of the place. Yes, well, I'll admit that I'm not thrilled about it, but it is a respectable job for a young man. Ah, respectable, perhaps. But I mean, can't say it's enjoyable. <laughs> agree with you there. <laughs> and you seem like a fine chap. Cheerful hmm? and sturdy, though a little bit clumsy. <sighs> well, you must be about my age. Are you from around here? Oh, no. Dorsetshire. It's about a day's travel. Ah, farm boy. <laughs> what brought you to this city? Well, my uncle owns the shop and I needed, well, an adventure, I suppose. <laughs> adventure? Well, <laughs> some kind of adventure you're having now, eh? Yes. Lad, you're in the right city doing the wrong thing. You're not going to have any excitement stoking a fire and sweating over a printing press all day. Yes, but that seems to be all I have the time for. Uncle keeps me working pretty hard. Oh, I imagine. I've met the old fellow. Seems rather stodgy, if you ask me. <laughs> but you know what? If you're looking for fun, perhaps I can help you. Well, what did you have in mind? It seems to me you need a night out on the town. You see the sights, enjoy some good brew at the Crown Tavern. Oh. Have you been there? Uh, no. Well, you can meet the ladies. My friends and I, we, we always have a, a fine time. <laughs> I don't know. I've, I've never actually stepped foot in a tavern. Never? Well, I suppose it's time you did then. Ah, uh, I'm not sure. Well, at least come with us. I was about to meet my friends across the river just now. It would be fun to be with chaps my own age. There you are. And surely you wouldn't have to partake in all the drinking unless you wanted to. I mean, you'd always come along you know, merely for the company. <laughs> well, th that wouldn't be too bad, I, I suppose. Ah, it's the spirit. So, close up shop, huh? Well... My friends are waiting, so... I, I will need to stay until we close, though. I... Ah, aren't you the one in charge here? Well, I certainly don't see any customers in here besides myself. Oh, close up early, old man. Your uncle will never know. I suppose a half hour early wouldn't do any harm. <laughs> oh, brilliant. <laughs> we only need to drop off these posters at my father's office on the corner and then we can go and meet the lads. You are in for a real adventure, my friend. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, let me wash up first. Yeah, I think that's a very good idea. Yes. So, who is your father? Oh, oh, well, he's a businessman here in town. He's quite well known. Oh. Uh, once you've been around town for a while, you'll hear his name on every corner, believe me. And and you you work for him, then? Well, I run errands on occasion, but I hate to spend too much time being on call for him. <laughs> That's what our servants are for. I have better things to do. Such as what? Well, for now, I like being the lad who saved you from this dull, dreary print shop. <laughs> Come along. Make haste. Oh, um, I'll need to grab my jacket. Um, my name's David, by the way. Ah, and I'm Henry. Your new best friend, eh? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Remember when we first met? Huh? 
You didn't even want to step foot in this happened. <laughs> I was a month later, I can't get you to leave them. Oh, I don't feel so well. Lamp posts. <laughs> but who lights those things anyway? Uh, the lamplighters. The what? Lamplighters. They Lamp come along as the dusk falls. Huh? They must be very tall. <laughs> They always have long wicks, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, all I know is that I could never reach it. Ah! You know, I dare say, you couldn't even hit one with a rock. Let's see you hit it, then. All right, I will. I'll take on that challenge. Here, find me a, find me a rock. Right. Yeah. Uh, this is a rock. Ah, <laughs> so it is. Uh, worthy of my expertise. Here we go. Now, now, watch this! Ah! Oh. ah oh, I hit it! You Got broke it! it. <laughs> hey! Hi, you, 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 <laughs> Sorry, sir. Oh, we'll save your breath, David. It's just a lamplighter. He can't do anything. What do you mean I can't? Well, well, I, I, I can call a bobby. That's what I'm doing. And he'll be sure to make you pay for, for, for breaking my lamp. <laughs> like anyone would listen to an old fool the, the lamplighter. <laughs> Oh, I bet you can't even count your fingers and toes, mate. Well, well, yeah, well, I, I, I might not know my numbers and that, but I, I know better than to break other people's property, I'll hey, tell you look that. Here, David, you wanted to see how to light a lamp, right? Well, look, here you go. Yeah. Hey, 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 no, let go of that, that's my ladder. Yeah. Give, give that back, stop that, stop it. Uh, uh, perhaps we ought to leave him alone. I mean, come on, oh, Henry. Come on. Now, you were the one that was so curious. You, but Henry, let go, you old fool. Uh, no, 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 you let go, it's, it's, it's mine. Get me here. Get me here. Got it. Oh, I knew I could take you, you old fool. Henry, I think he's hit his head on the bench. Huh? I think you've knocked him out. <laughs> well, good. All the better. When he wakes up, he won't remember a thing. Oh, no, Henry, his head is bleeding. We have to do something. We need to get out of here. It's what we need to do. Well, come on. No, we can't leave. This. Somebody else will find him. Let's go. But Henry... But... What's going on here? It's late for you lads to be out, don't you think? Uh, yes, sir, officer. Uh, we were just now... <gasps> Murphy! What happened to him? What did you boys do? Murphy! Murphy, are you all right? Oh, oh my, my, my head. That's a nasty cut you had there, Murphy. I'll need to get you to the dock for that. Uh, no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll be fine. I'm very sorry, sir. All right, Mervyn, you just stay still. Don't move, and I'll get someone to help you. So you boys, follow me. Don't step one foot out of my sight, you hear? You're listening to Lamplighter Theatre. Come visit us at lamplighter.net.
And I love my grandpa. I love my mama. I love my dada. I love my brother. God bless. I love God. And Jesus. Amen. My name is Elias. Please tune in Sundays for children's Bible stories. Stories of real heroes of the Bible. Followed by Mark Hamby's Lamplighter Theater. Building character one story at a time. Starting at 5 p.m. Pacific. That's on IndieGospelRadio.org. Hi, kids. Well, that brings us to a close for this first portion of the program of Children's Bible Stories, and I hope you'll join me next week for Children's Bible Stories, beginning at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, right here on IndieGospelRadio.org. And um, with that in mind, I'd just like to uh, wish you all a pleasant evening. Thank you for tuning in, and may the peace of the Lord be with you. God bless. Father, I place into your hands the things that I can do. Father, I place into your hands the times that I've been through. Father, I place into your hands the way that I should go. Story of John Henderson, Part 1 and Part 2. Clang. Jesus declared that he had the power to forgive sins. How did the religious leaders react to this declaration? Listen to the Bible from Mark 2. He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, Get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of the mall. From Mark 2, listen to the Bible. It's great for the soul. Hear more at radiobible.org. That's radiobible.org. How do you do? Thieves and robbers have always been with us. 
self-centered people bent on stealing from others. As a teenager, the man in this story was working in a drugstore when such a crook confronted him. That terrifying event was linked to the robber who tried to steal his destiny before his heart and mind and life were unshackled. <laughs> young man was digging in the freezer at work for a popsicle when he felt something repeatedly poking him in the ribs. Quit poking me! This is a holdup. What do you want? Give me the money. Okay, don't shoot. Skip the change! Okay, okay! Come on, hurry up! Give me the cash! Clean out the register in the back, too. Here. What? That's all? Come on, there's got to be more! No, there's no more! Proclaiming the good news, this is Unshackled. True life stories dramatized and produced in Chicago by Pacific Garden Mission. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, according to timeless advice. Yet some people forfeit their reputation for personal gain. Some even end up homeless. Whatever the reason for their predicament, the mission welcomes them. As many as a thousand men, women, and children each day. The mission provides nourishing meals, fresh clothing, and a safe place to sleep while they get back on their feet. Mission pastors and counselors introduce each person to the one whose good name is to be chosen rather than great riches because the world's riches pale in comparison to the wealth he offers. Lifting up his name and his truth is the reason we produce these testimonies. Now for broadcast around the earth, here is program number 3373 in the series Unshackled, the program that makes you face yourself and think. Heard you had an exciting day, son. Yes. Tell your dad what happened, John. Well, I was bent over the freezer and didn't see him come in. I just felt something poking me and I straightened up really mad. What a shock to see this guy in a nylon mask. What a creep. All the kids and the owner ran out the back. Who called the police? The owner. I'm glad you kept your wits about you. Well, there was a big cash box by my feet, but I didn't let him know about that. Did you give the police a description? Yeah. A police artist came in and I drew a picture of the guy. Your artistic skills helped. I was pretty nervous. I was sure glad to see him leave. You're a hero, John. You could have been shot. God was protecting you, son. Before long, the young man in our story would face even greater challenges. This is the true testimony of John Henderson, right now on Unshackled. I grew up in North Minneapolis, the older of two boys. Mine was a happy childhood. Our neighborhood was a Norman Rockwell suburb with kids riding bicycles and having fun. Grandma and Grandpa were Swedish and often came to visit. And we went to see them on their 280-acre farm where my brother Bruce and I played and worked. Ah, we had great fun. But I was an introvert and wanted no part of school. How was your first day of school, son? I didn't want to go. <laughs> That's normal, Jeanette. Well, John refused to go. I had to drag him all the way. You're kidding. I'm serious. I dragged him by one arm like he was a log and him looking up. All he saw was trees going by over his head. Your mom is not a tow truck, John. You get to school tomorrow under your own steam. Walk like a man. In time, I love school. Mom always took us to the mainline church she attended. Bruce on one side, me on the other dad, refused to go with us. He preferred staying home or golfing. My father drank heavily even then, but I didn't realize the extent of the problems his drinking created till I was a teenager. Al, where have you been? Come on, boys. See what I brought? A bag full of hamburgers! Yeah! Thanks, Dad! <laughs> Don't you come home late and try to appease me with a peace offering. 
You get out. Mom, huh? come on, we're hungry. Honey, let the boys have the burger. Yeah. It isn't all right, Al. I'm glad you're home, but I'm mad. Come on, they like burgers. I got french fries, too. Oh. I love french fries. Every time you get paid, you go to a bar first. Don't be a nag, Jeanette. I got some for you, too. You spend too much money in the bars. I have plenty of money, Jeanette. Now, sit down and let's eat. We loved our dad, but he drank more and more. He hid alcohol in his car and was caught drunk with it. He was put in jail and sent to the workhouse in Minneapolis. The arguments and fighting increased, so Bruce and I sought reasons to be gone. I was 14 when Bruce and I went skiing and I broke my leg. It hurt so bad. Some people put me on a toboggan and pulled me down the slope to get help. <laughs> Look at my leg. <laughs> it's been crooked. Oh, it hurts so bad. You're going to be okay, John. We're, we're getting help. Poor father, which heart in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Oh, I can't say this. I think I'm crazy. We're almost there. I, I see the ambulance waiting. Oh, look at that kid. Oh. <laughs> It'll be okay. All right, folks, move it back. Get him inside. Not you, kid. You can't come in here. That's my brother. I'm going with him. No, you can't. No, no, I am staying. I'm going with John. They couldn't keep Bruce out of the ambulance, so they gave up and let him go with me to the hospital in Minneapolis. Later, as I lay in the gurney, I was glad he was there because I didn't know anyone. Then my parents arrived, and they transferred me to another hospital where the doctor put a cast on my leg. The doctor says we can take you home. Why did the other hospital send us away? They said my income was too high. When can I leave? Your doctor is preparing the release papers. When my leg healed, Bruce and I helped our grandparents in the field, driving tractors and taking care of the animals. We liked to go to the farm because our parents didn't argue when we were there and Dad was okay then. When I got my driver's license, I bought a 10-year-old car so I could get away from home. That began my passion with cars and then motorcycles. Mom still insisted we go to church with her, but there were other churches vying for our attention. Who's at the door, Ma? Oh, one of those religious fanatics. What's a religious fanatic? You don't want to be one. They carry a Bible everywhere, and all they talk about is religion. Oh, I would have talked to him. You'd be sorry. What did he give you? A pamphlet. Oh, I took it to get rid of him. Can I read it? Help yourself. It says, you must be born again. What does that mean? Oh, don't worry about it. We made sure that was taken care of for you. I liked the pastor of our church, and at one time, I even wanted to become a pastor. But I really wanted to be a commercial artist, so I chose it as my major when I started college. I worked at the drugstore while in high school and later was hired at a local ice cream plant. I was working there to pay for my studies. I traded my first car for a white sports car and a guy at work noticed. Ah, I saw your sports car, John. Nice ride. Thanks. Love it. Yeah, red leather seats. Man, I bet the girls line up to go out with you. Eh, not exactly. Yeah, I guess your classes and your weekend parties take up most of your time. Well, my major's commercial arts, so my schedule's busy. Hey, there's a hayseed from Iowa who started working here recently. He's super religious and nosy. Yeah, he comes around asking questions, talking about God, just... Thought I'd warn you. <laughs> hey, 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 a little religion would do you guys some good. Yeah, yeah. Even though I defended religion, I was a party guy as much as they were. Gambling, drinking, dancing, and dating girls. One day during a break at work, I was sitting in the lunchroom when a young man walked over to me. I'm Oris. Yeah, you're the guy from Iowa. They call you Hayseed. Right. I'm a hayseed from Iowa. I help my grandpas on their farms. I love it. Mind if I ask you a question? Go right ahead. Are you open-minded? I attend U of M. You don't get any more open-minded than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you're right. Are you interested in spiritual things? Yes, I am. Oh, great. 
Well, if I could show you how you can know for sure you will go to heaven, would you be interested? Well, sure. Who wouldn't? Some people aren't interested in life after death. But the Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. Oh, I broke my leg once skiing and I thought I would die, but I've never heard that anyone could be sure of heaven. If I could show you four verses so you'd know how to get to heaven, would that be all right with you? Sure. All right, it's quieter in the locker room. Let's go down there to talk. We sat on a bench, and he opened a little black Bible and began a conversation that would change my world. We'll hear about John's conversation with Oris shortly. Now, though, here's Pacific Garden Mission's president, Phil Kwiatkowski. Thanks, Timothy. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. The Bible says in Psalm 119, we have a Bible program for men and women who choose to follow Christ at Pacific Garden Mission and want to immerse themselves in God's truth. The Bible program is a rigorous year of study that develops not only knowledge of God's Word, but also godly character and personal discipline. By word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee, the psalmist wrote. And in the Bible program, men learn the meaning of true manhood, of being man enough to stand up for Christ. Free of addictive habits, they can become soul winners that hold steady jobs and remain faithful to their families. They rejoin the community as givers instead of takers. Women may also choose to join the resident Bible program at the mission, a year of intensive study of God's Word like the men's Bible program. Learning the promises and the faithfulness of God is a life-changing experience for men and women who come to the mission in despair, and the Bible program works to accomplish this transformation. Some months ago, a man came into the mission drug-addicted. He writes, I was in a state of despair, hopeless at the end of my wits. My outlook for the future was dim. I was at the end of my ropes, and I knew I needed God. He joined the Bible program, grew in the faith, and was able to connect with our career development program. He continues, My job title now is Data Center Engineer. I am employed by a leading IT Fortune 500 company. This is only an act of God. This is so amazing. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. To learn more about this ministry to men and women, write to Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. I uh, have some sections marked to help me show you the gospel. Here in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Oh, chapter 5, verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, right here, chapter 6, verse 23, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. But the Gospel of John, chapter 3, says it all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Thanks, Oris, but I already know everything you just showed me. I learned all that when I was young. All three points, that I'm a sinner... There's a heaven and a hell, and Jesus died for me. You didn't tell me anything I didn't know. Well, John, do you know how to be saved? No, I've never heard how to be saved, but I think my good deeds will be sufficient. John, the Bible says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. God's standard is perfection. For that you must be born again. Mom told me that was taken care of when I was a baby, so I'm already born again. Little babies go to heaven if they die. But you're a man now. You have to choose Christ to be born again. Show me the verse and I'll believe you. All right, right, right here. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. You read it. 
For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Huh. Have you ever heard that verse before? I said yes, because I wanted to get away from him. But I lied. I was interested to learn that it was possible to know how to be saved. I thought to myself, I'll just ask the Lord to save me sometime. And I went back to work. I didn't follow through because I was too interested in cars and having fun at parties. From time to time, Oris brought me pamphlets, and I assured him that I was a Christian, hoping he'd leave me alone. John, since you say you're born again, you should tithe your earnings. Uh, what do you mean? Tithing means giving 10% of your income to the Lord. 10%? I've never heard of that. Here's this pamphlet that explains what the Bible teaches. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Malachi chapter 3. That's really in the Bible? Sure is. You can find these words in your own Bible. I showed the pamphlet to my boss and asked him what he thought of it. He said, well, it's in the Bible, and it's right. From then on, I tried to avoid Oris. I'd see him coming and I'd hide behind huge pillars. When he did catch me, he'd say, John, did you receive Jesus yet? Finally, I went to see the pastor at the church where we had attended with Mom. Hi, John. I haven't seen you in a while. I'm in college and working too, so uh, <laughs> I've been busy. I like your new car, spoke wheels and all. Oh, thanks. What can I do for you? I have some questions about the Bible. You've come to the right place. A guy at work's been hounding me about getting saved, being born again, so I ventured to some other churches to see if he was telling the truth, since I've never heard that expression here. What did you learn? Well, I got pamphlets from eight different churches, and if the pamphlets didn't follow the Bible, I threw them away. None of them said anything about being born again except these, but everyone calls them fanatics. What do you know about being born again? I was in one of those churches once, and I didn't like it. Born again is a term for spiritual birth that happens when you're young. Your parents made sure of that. <laughs> That's great, because I really don't want to be a fanatic. My family would disown me. <laughs> yeah. Um, Pastor... Do you think there was something wrong with the process used? Maybe it was outdated? What? Could it lose its power? My life is a mess. My dad is a mess. He's drunk all the time. Maybe there was something wrong with my family and it, it didn't work on me. You can leave now. John, I never want to talk to you about the Bible again. He was really angry, so I left and hopped in my sports car. I thought to myself, that's it for religion. I'm never going to church again. It's too hard. I was hurt and discouraged and confused. I drove out on the highway at a high speed. So fast, my sports car started lifting off the highway. That scared me, and I let up on the gas. I slowed down, calmed down, and I flipped on the radio. Jesus said that you must be born again. Did you hear that? He said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. There is no other way to God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Do you realize how exclusive that is? No man but by me. Jesus Christ is the only door to heaven, the only door to God. The Gospel of John chapter 3 lays it all out. The Son of God came to pay the penalty for our sin, and he predicted how he would die. He said in verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent of the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Yet people turn away from God's offer of salvation, and this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. I'd heard that man preach before, but had never heard this sermon. 
I got irritated and turned him off. After that, I tried not to think about religion. Then, Oris would come to see me at home. Your friend is here, John. Oh, not Oris. Looks like it. He's not my friend. He's a pest. I'm going to get my gun and shoot him. Ow. I'll hit him off at the door. Hey, uh, Oris. <laughs> How you doing, John? Not too good, Oris. Well, I haven't seen you at work, so I thought I'd come by and just see if you're all right. This isn't a good time to talk. Well, then I won't stay. Good. Um, my dad doesn't like to talk about religion. Oh, he can just listen. He doesn't like to listen either. It's better if you don't come back, Oris. God commands us to preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Dad's got his gun and he's out of sorts because he's drinking. I won't go in your house, John. <laughs> Don't worry. Good. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Hey, um, I'll look for you at work. Are you born again yet? I'm working on it. Uh, tell your dad that Jesus loves him. I hung out with my friends quite a bit after that. It was an unsettling time for us. Communism and communists were in our cities and universities. Some of my classmates from other countries used drugs and had fancy cars. Sometimes, hundreds of us would come to dances and the party would become wild. Mom called the police and they forbade us to return, but we found another place. Soon, it burned down. My world was shifting, like sand on a seashore. If Forrest was here, he'd say something about the Lord. Yeah, let, let's not talk about him now. One of these days... I'm going to work up the courage to visit his church. <laughs> You're going to be sorry. I heard that preacher breathe fire from the pulpit. I knew in my heart he was right. But I just didn't want to be a religious nut like Horace. Sometimes when he'd come near me, I'd leap into the semi-trailer and begin loading ice cream off the conveyor belt. Horace would tell me about the Lord anyway and be a friend to me. Other times, he would come by at lunch and sit with me in my sports car. Having lunch? I'm trying to. How come you eat your lunch in your car? <laughs> I like to be alone and think. Huh. Well, you eat and I'll talk. No lunch? I have the bread of life, John. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. How do you always have Bible verses on the tip of your tongue? I'm in seminary. It's my calling, John. I just love the Lord because he saved me. You don't have to call on me all the time. God is the one calling you, John. He loves you and wants to save you. We all sin. There is none righteous. No, not one. I must be saved because I believe what you're saying. The devils also believe and tremble, but they're not saved. Why don't you come visit my church sometime? I've been thinking about it. Okay, I will. Even though I asked Oris not to come to my house anymore, he did. I kept my sports car parked with the top down as an escape plan. Oh boy, it's a good thing your dad isn't home. Why? That looks like your friend's car out there. <sighs> An old green Pontiac? Yeah. That's Oris, all right. He'll be knocking at the door in just a moment. Tell him I'm gone. I'm not going to lie for you. You won't be lying because I'll be gone. John, get back here. <laughs> this is ridiculous. My worries were over. I'd missed Doris. But Mom was smoking mad. Instead of me getting the gospel witness, she did, as I heard later. Did he leave? Yes, he's gone. Oh. John Henderson, you'd better not do that to me again, leaving me like that. I had to listen to that man talk for a good 15 minutes. That's all? That's enough. I listen to him more than that every time I see him. He's pushy, all right. Yeah, you shouldn't have let him in, Mom. I didn't, but I couldn't shut the door in his face, either. You probably needed to hear the gospel, Mom. Horace says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You'd better not end up like him, or I'll disown you. One Sunday, I went to the church Oris attended to see if his pastor breathed fire from the pulpit. I sat up in the front in the third row, but there was no fire. Just Bible teaching. 
and it was good. I felt so convicted that I could hardly eat later. I realized that I was running from God, straight into the jaws of death, damnation, and hell. Four different times in one week, I came close to dying or causing death to others. We'll hear about that and how he escaped next week in the conclusion of John's testimony. Listening friend, tomorrow is promised to no one. So don't run from God like John Henderson. If you have never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, why not do so now by praying with us? Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God I believe you died on the cross for my sin. I believe you rose from the dead and live to save me now. Lord, I know I am such a sinner, and I repent of my sin. Save me. Please come into my life and change me. Make me like you want me to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. How do you do? Denial is a coping mechanism that helps us through distressing situations. Denial gives us time to absorb facts that are frightening. But denial can be dangerous, keeping us from the truth, like the man in this story. He hid from someone whose help he needed, hid because he feared losing control, until his heart and mind and life were unshackled. <laughs> Proclaiming the way, the truth, and the life. This is Unshackled. True life stories dramatized and produced in Chicago by Pacific Garden Mission. Homeless people arrive at our doorstep, powerless to change their circumstances. The door is always open at the old lighthouse, welcoming those without strength. Thanks to faithful friends who send financial gifts, the mission provides nourishing meals, showers and fresh clothing, and a safe place to sleep. Even medical care is given to resident guests in our clinic. Mission pastors and counselors share the truth that sets them free, the truth that lights the way out of darkness and confusion. God's truth empowers them. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Now for broadcast around the earth, here is program number 3374 in the series, Unshackled, the program that makes you face yourself and think. Something wrong, John? You've been sitting out here in your car for a long time. Uh, I'm alright, Bruce. Uh, Dan's passed out, so it's quiet inside. You know, when his uncle taught him to drink, he couldn't know how it was going to affect his future. Yeah, I've been thinking about some of the, my decisions in life, too, how they could affect me and others. Your car wasn't made for thinking. It was made for going places. Yeah, well, today it almost took me to oblivion. How so? Uh, there's the new highway coming from the lake, and I made a wrong turn and drove in the northbound lane going south. Sixty miles an hour. You, you survived without a scratch. Yeah. Cars and semis were honking at me and swerving. What a shock. What'd you do? I sped across the grass median between the two roads. What a relief to go in the right direction. Lucky you didn't wreck this beautiful sports car. Yeah, lucky I wasn't killed, too. I'm not ready to meet my maker. John Henderson was 20 years old then, a lover of sports cars, and a student at a secular university in Minnesota. This is the story of how he prepared to meet his maker. His true testimony right now on Unshackled. For months, I've been wrestling with myself, avoiding a man named Oris, who worked at the ice cream plant where I worked to earn money for college. He kept telling me I needed to be saved, but my first love was my obsession with cars, motorcycles, and a party lifestyle. I wanted to speed away from the quarreling at home and my dad's drunkenness. Every time dad drank, he got belligerent. 
I told you I didn't want that. You deliberately set me up. No, I didn't, Al. I was trying to help you. One day, all my friends wanted to ride their motorcycles to a carnival up by Elk River. After we were there for a while, they started drinking. I was under conviction trying to change my ways. Besides, I'd seen what alcohol did to my dad, and I needed to stop before it was too late. So I hopped on my bike and rolled down the highway. All of a sudden, a car came right at me at a fast rate of speed, like the driver was trying to kill me. I had high fenders and knobby tires for hill climbing, so I veered down in the ditch. Maybe the driver fell asleep or was drunk. Either way, I would have been dead. Shaken by the experience, I headed home. In Minneapolis, I stopped for a red light and was planning to jump the light when a thought came that I should wait for the green light. When the light turned green, a car shot through the intersection going 50 miles an hour. Again, I would have been killed. Later that week, I was driving the big ice cream truck, making deliveries when the light ahead turned yellow. I usually raced through yellow lights, but again, the thought came to wait. So I hit the brakes hard. Thirteen little children ran across the street in front of me, their teacher trying to catch them. I felt sick to my stomach at what might have happened. Then came the weekend when I drove the wrong way on a freeway. You look beat, John. Hard day. Like no other. I made cookies. I couldn't hold them down, Mom. What's wrong? It's what almost happened. This week was scary. You told me about the car almost hitting you on your motorcycle and the school kids running out in front of your ice cream truck. There's more? Yeah. Today I was coming from the lake and I turned onto a new highway and found myself going 60 miles an hour the wrong way into oncoming traffic. How could you do that, John? Were you drinking? No. The other two lanes were lower than the ones I turned onto. I didn't see them. What did you do? I drove across the grass median to the right lanes. I was shaking. You were lucky. Why are these things happening to me? I've had four close calls in the last week. I don't know, son. Oris keeps telling me I need to get saved. Maybe I should listen to him. Ignore that man. He's crazy. He's not crazy, Mom. He showed me the truth from the Bible, but I've rejected it. Seeking answers, I'd talked with the pastor of our mainline church, but he was no help. He knew nothing about being born again and told me not to come back with a Bible. So I asked other people, including the girl I was dating. She didn't know, so I asked the sister of one of my friends. Who's this guy at work that's bugging you? Uh, his name is Oris. He comes around at breaks to talk to me about Jesus and other things in the Bible. I've attended church most of my life. Eat lunch somewhere else. I have, but he finds me. Sometimes he even comes by the house. Unannounced. Dad threatened to shoot him. <laughs> I tell you, I've never seen such persistence. Well, what does he want? He wants me to get saved, to be born again. I told him I was as a baby. John, how can a decision made by someone's parents when they're a baby save them? Well, Babies um... can be dedicated to the Lord, and they go to him if they die like King David's baby son. But adults have to make a choice to be saved. Horus said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's right. My spiritual eyes were finally opened, and I knew that the decision to be born again had to be made by me. The next day at work, that verse filled my thoughts. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The simplicity and the truth of those words were comforting to me. As I started down the steps to the ice cream deep freeze, I felt a question in my heart. Have you done what it says? I hadn't called on the Lord, so the thought persisted. Then the question, why not? Then the thought came, why not now? I said, okay, I will. The temperature in the ice cream storage room was 60 below zero with six inches of snow and ice on the floor. But I got on my knees and prayed. Oh God, if you're real and all that Aura says is true, then God, please save me if you can. I have lots of sins. If you can forgive them, please forgive them. And I thank you very much. In Jesus' name, amen. 
I wasn't sure I'd said all the right words, but I was sincerely seeking God's salvation. My prayer took less than a minute. My boss began yelling, send down the ice cream. I'd expected to be doing some jumping around, but instead, I just felt happy that I obeyed God, that he brought me to repentance. I was very confused by the change in my life. The first week I quit swearing, the next month I quit drinking, then I stopped smoking. My buddies and my family noticed. Hey, are you reading the Bible again? John? Yeah, it's interesting. I hope it's not contagious. Oh, I hope it is, Bruce. You quit smoking and drinking, didn't you? Yeah. And you haven't been going out with your friends either. Not interested anymore. Now you're praying before you eat, John. What's going on? I asked Jesus to save me. I knew something had happened. Well, you should be glad, Mom. You always read the Bible stories and prayed with us as kids. That's different. Keep it up and you'll end up getting tossed in the loony bin by guys in white coats. I can't turn back now. Next thing you'll be getting rid of your sports car. I'm thinking about it. I could use the money for school. If you become like that Oris and join his church, we're going to kick you out of the house. Well, you might have to do it. Come here, John. If you really believe that's right, you go ahead and do it. That's why your great-grandfather left Sweden. He stood for his religious beliefs. Man, you're wrecking your life. There were other changes in my life. And finally, I was miserable. I quit gambling and going out with guys who drank and partied. They mocked and laughed at me. It was all so confusing to me. I decided to find Oris' apartment and ask him about all these changes. John! It's good to see you. Have a seat. Uh, can I get you something? No, Oris. I'm miserable. I prayed to God for salvation about a month ago and I stopped drinking and smoking. I can't tolerate the cursing and other things I did with my buddies. Everyone thinks I'm insane. Praise the Lord. Why are you praising the Lord when I feel terrible? You know, today I, I sat in my drawing class at the university. There's always a bunch of people outside the door watching us sketch the female model. And that never bothered me before, but today it did. I'm never going back to that class. John, I've got a verse for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. A new creature? You mean I'm normal? Yes. The Spirit of God lives in you now, and He's transforming you. Cool. <laughs> but you still have your old nature, and it wrestles with the Spirit of God. Not so cool. Jesus said, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The word of God will keep you and help you to stand. God will give you peace. I drove home in peace, happy to know that the changes were because I was saved. Some weeks later, while driving home from work, I remembered that Oris had invited me to their prayer service, so I went. I spotted Oris and his wife and sat down in the empty chair beside him. That night, my life would take an unexpected turn. We'll hear what happened to John shortly. Now, though, here's Pacific Garden Mission's president, Phil Kwiatkowski. Thanks, Timothy. People who visit Pacific Garden Mission are astonished at the size and scope of our ministry to the homeless. They sign our guest book with comments like this, I was able to see the greatness of God's work through the PGM tour. Another woman wrote, I love your mission and your heart and all you do for Jesus. A man wrote, I love Unshackled and PGM. The Lord is in this place. We give God the glory for helping so many distraught people at the mission. If you have never visited, please come soon. Any day is fine. But Saturdays are special because you can be a part of the audience watching a live Unshackled production. One of our staff or Bible program students will give you a tour of the facilities and you'll see firsthand how we help the hundreds of men, women, and children find new life at the old lighthouse. A tour of the mission will open your eyes to the many opportunities to volunteer, sorting clothes that are donated, serving in the dining room, working in the greenhouse, or making beds in the overnight guest dorms. One visitor commented, 
Pacific Garden Mission is a great place for people to get their lives back. That sentiment also applies to our volunteers, many of whom are with us for decades, helping less fortunate ones find new life. So visit anytime and learn how you might serve the Lord with us. We are thankful for all our volunteers. This ministry would be hindered without them. We also get comments by mail and email. A prisoner recently wrote, As a new listener to Unshackled, I find great hope and inspiration from true life stories. A woman wrote, Thank you for all you do. It is a bright light in a dark world. For more information about visiting us or volunteering, write to Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. That's Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. Oris urged me to go to the next room in church and meet with the pastor and deacons, so I did. Oris told us about you, John. He said you recently received Christ. I did, and I'm glad. Would you be willing to give your testimony to the church? Uh, what do I say? Just tell them what happened. Okay, that's easy. Oris kept talking to me about Jesus, how he died to save me. Oris witnessed to you at work? Every time he could catch me. I hid from him, but he never gave up. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You want me to give my testimony right now? Yes. We'll go out with you. I'm standing here because of Oris. He kept pestering me at work, talking about Jesus, how I needed to be saved. I didn't know what he was talking about, but I'm sure thankful now. He showed me in scripture that you must be born again. I knew about Jesus, I attended church with my mother and brother, but I didn't know about the need to be born again. And I didn't know that the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes, I thought I didn't need to make a personal decision to receive Christ as my savior. I was almost killed three or four times one week while driving. And I would have died and gone to hell. But now I'm saved because I know that Christ died for my sins. Thank you, Oris. You didn't give up on me. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Brothers and sisters, Scripture says, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. After the service, they invited me to the library to meet the youth. I was expecting five kids, but there were about 50 who welcomed me, and I was soon involved in youth activities like roller skating that I enjoyed. The church also had a Bible college that I began attending. My life was changing rapidly. What happened to your car? Is it in the shop? No, I sold it. And you bought this old junker? Why? I needed the money for college. I'm taking some classes at the Bible college. Bible college? John, you're ruining your life. Life is more than luxury things and fancy cars, Bruce. But you don't party or date pretty girls anymore. What's next? Whatever God wants. <laughs> I've never been happier in my life. You should give your life to Christ. Get saved. Now I talk to Dad. He's the one that needs to get saved. Everyone needs to be saved, Bruce, and I've talked to Dad. He prayed with me. <laughs> yeah, well, he still gets drunk. I know. I'll keep praying for him. I met Sandy at church, and we dated for the next three years. I went to seminary, but we married before I finished. Dad had recovered from surgery to remove a cancerous growth in his throat, yet he still drank. I did janitorial work at the church to help pay my way in seminary. One day I came home for lunch and lay down to rest before going back to work. That wasn't a very long rest, John. I have a prompting in my heart for Dad. How is he doing? I don't know, but I need to go see him now. You've witnessed to him so many times. Yes, he's professed faith in Christ, but he always goes back to drinking. I know, John. Let's pray before I go. Sure, honey. Lord, 
I lift up my dad to you. You know him just as you know every heart. I pray that you will save him and transform his life like you did mine. There is none like you, Lord. Our trust and hope is in you. When I got to my folks' home, Dad was lying on the garage floor, drunk. I shook him and woke him up. Dad had a stone in his throat to help him breathe and talk. What are you doing? I'm gonna break this evil stuff. I was thirsty. Jesus offers the living water, Dad. I explain how to quench your thirst forever. I know, but... Come on. Let's get you up and into the house. Dad, I don't know what to do for you. Tell me one more time, son. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You, me, everyone. So you're not alone, Dad. And the penalty for sin is death, eternal damnation in hell. Everybody dies, son. Because of Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. But God provided a way through Jesus to live in heaven forever. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty by shedding his blood on the cross for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever, Dad. You have to believe God, repent of your sin, and ask Jesus into your life to be your Savior. Then you'll be saved. Let's get on our knees and pray. Oh God, help my dad come to you sincerely with his whole heart as he prays for salvation. God, I know I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. I want you to change me like you did my son John. Save me and help me quit drinking. Please, Lord, save my dad and fill him with your Holy Spirit. Give him the power to say no to the enemy of his soul. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. God will help you resist alcohol, Dad. I've got to do it. All went well for almost a month. Hello? John, it's Mom. What is it, Mom? The police just came here. Your father was found in the front seat of his car. Is he all right? No. He's gone, John. What happened? The police said your dad was drinking, and the bartender put him in his car to sleep it off. What? They took his keys so he couldn't drive. But it's cold outside. I know. Oh, so who found Dad? When the bar closed, they all went home. Later, his drinking buddy went out to check on him. He was dead. Oh, Mom. I'm so sorry. The police need someone to go down to the morgue and identify him. Your brother doesn't want to see him like that. Will you go? Yes. I'll go, Mom. Did you go already? Yes. He was doing so well, John. He didn't drink for a whole month, and it was wonderful. Home was so peaceful. At least you have that memory. He even complimented me and thanked me for what I've done. Mom, he prayed with me for salvation exactly a month ago. I believe he was serious. He asked God to deliver him from his drinking problem. I didn't know that. Well, he'll never be tempted again. I graduated from seminary in 1970, and God called us to our first church in South Bend, Indiana, where I was youth pastor and then assistant pastor. I also preached at Pacific Garden Mission. From there, we went to Pine Island, Minnesota, where we started a church and a former theater in 1973 and lived in an apartment above the theater. There, we raised four children, three boys and a girl. Praise the Lord. Why do you say this isn't going to work, John? The church was supposed to be 70 people, but half of them left. Church planting is not easy. Well, all they do is argue. The early church had its problems too, honey. Some of them didn't get along. I want to leave. This just is not going to work. That's okay with me if you think it's what God wants, but... What are you learning? If thou faint in the day of adversity, Thy strength is small. Good one. Proverbs? Chapter 24, verse 10. Where would we be if Jesus had thrown in the towel? Yes. 
It's amazing how God leads you to the right place in his word just when you need it. Praise the Lord. Amen. He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Always has been, always will be. I've been talking with the Lord and he's laid it on my heart to be a missionary pastor. So you'll stay? Yes. Call your pastor friends and they'll pray for us. We stayed more than five years as the church became strong and the next pastor built a new place of worship. God's word does not return to him void. One night my mother came to a prayer meeting with a friend and asked us to pray because her friend had cancer. They were on their way to a famous clinic. They stopped on the way home to report that mom's friend had no cancer. My mother was saved during that visit also. Thank the Lord. When you first started talking about being born again, I thought you were crazy. Now I understand. It isn't my idea, Mom. It's God's plan. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's true. Well, you set things in motion, walking us to church every Sunday, teaching us to be honest and hardworking. Raising kids is not easy. <laughs> I'm glad you stayed with Dad. That wasn't easy either. God's way is the right way, son. And I'm thankful for the Lord's help. God's way is the only way. We served in several other churches over the years before we settled in Ham Lake, Minnesota, where we have lived for the last 29 years. To my wife of 47 years and me, the Lord gave 11 beautiful grandchildren. After having three heart attacks and two pacemakers, we've cut back a little but Sandy and I still serve the risen Lord Jesus. And I'm still thankful that God sent Oris to tell me the gospel of Christ, that I must be born again. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out, and find pasture. There is no other way to God, listening friend. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. If you have never invited Christ into your life, you're missing the greatest joy life offers. He came to give us life and life more abundantly. Turn to him now and ask him to save you. There are no special words because God sees your heart. If you need help in making this crucial decision for Christ, get in touch with Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. The telephone number in Chicago, 312-492-9410. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. Visit our website to learn more about this ministry www.unshackled.org A listener emailed us recently, I met the Lord three years back after listening to Unshackled for a time. Well, thanks for telling us. And please, Thank the manager of this station for broadcasting Unshackled. This is program number 3374. Heard in part two of the true story of John Henderson were Steve Bayorgin, Marcy Mencotti, Jim McCants, Michael Walner, Jennifer Dimmitt, and Colin Garrity. Original music, Scott Griffin. Sound, Nadine Aloysio Sorensen. Engineer Kim Rasmussen, script Kenitha Gabler, and I'm Timothy Gregory. Unshackled is produced by Pacific Garden Mission to show through true stories. 
that if your life is empty, it can be filled to overflowing. Please write today. Your letter means a great deal to us. The address? Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. You may call Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago and talk with someone who cares. 312-492-9410. Someone is waiting for your call. 312-492-9410. Friday here on the Indie Gospel Radio from 5 to 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for music for the soul and words to live by. Right here with your radio host Jerry on IndieGospelRadio.org. God bless. This is your radio host, Jerry, for the Dusty Roads Radio Program, signing off for this evening. And I'd just like to thank you all for tuning in and wish you all a pleasant evening. And may the peace of the Lord be with you. God bless.